Thanks very much, Ben. Um, good morning, everybody. It's great to see such a big, enthusiastic crowd. Um, I'd like to talk today about uh, species boundaries and asters, and of course, everybody knows asters in the broad sense as being a, a group full of trouble. Um, the the uh, piece of it I'm going to talk about today is the genus Eucephalus, which is a relatively small and maybe better behaved group than some in the asters, but they have their, their own difficulties. Uh, and uh, the problem, the broader problem I want to talk about really is how can we manage species that are both taxonomically difficult and rare, which is what the, the session is about, and uh, all sorts of uh, problems uh, come up. We have difficulty with such groups in recognizing species boundaries for rare taxa, and are often considerable differences of opinion on um, what to call the species, uh, what rank them, and so all of that leads to problems on the ground, um, incorrect or inconsistent IDs resulting from people having difficulty knowing where to draw the boundaries or using different keys written by different people at different times, and that's certainly been, been true in this group. And then as a result of that, we often have difficulty knowing if these rare species are even really rare or what their geographic distributions uh, really are. So Eucephalus is, is a small group of, of about 10 species. It's one of the many things that used to be aster in the broad sense and, and is one of the segregate genera of asters in North America. They're often called the cascade asters and they're widespread in montane habitats over Western North America. And they look like a lot of asters do. They're leafy stem perennials with uh, paniculate inflorescences. They have white to violet um, gray, gray corollas in this group, the distinguishing features are that there tend to be relatively few ray. In fact, I went to a, a cool paper early on in my career about this group, and there, it was about Fibonacci numbers, where each number is the sum of the previous two, and the ray flowers in this group often fit the Fibonacci series, but with some variation. But some of them are rayless. And they also typically have ridged or keel um, Fillaries, which is distinct in the, in the small group. Molecular evidence separates this uh, genus into three clays. One of them is just one species, the easternmost species, Ele um, Cephalus elegans, and then two groups further west, one with three species in the Pacific Northwest, and uh, uh, the remaining six uh, widespread along the Cascade. Sierra Nevada crest, and that's the group I'm going to talk about here. In this group of six species, one is very widespread. It's mainly uh, further north and further east than the others. The others are all um, pretty much distributed along the Cascades and, and um, Sierra Nevada, and with much uh, geographical overlap, and you can see that Southern Oregon, Northern California is the trouble spot for this group. There are four to five species often co-occurring, if those really are species. So I'm going to focus just on those, the five species of this geographic region. They have extensive geographic and therefore also morphological overlap. Uh, the, these are the five here, and one of them is uh, typically distinguished from the others uh, by having rays, that's, that's Lodophilus, and the others are all rayless or or nearly so. The impetus for the study was uh, this species, uh, Eucephalus vialis, which has been known for, for some time to be a uh, rare species in Oregon. It's, uh, it has threatened status in Oregon. It's known from about 10 populations in the southern Willamette Valley, a little south of there. And it's also listed as a survey managed species uh, under the Northwest Forest Plan. And so essentially that means that we don't know as much as we should know about it. So the questions, specific questions for this work that we did were, does this, does this thing occur elsewhere? Are things that are uh, vialis-like in, in Southern Oregon and Northern California, are they Eucephalus vialis or are they something else? Um, and uh, there are other, there's certainly rayless asters that look like that in, the, in that part of the world, and so the question is, um, how do we separate? If there are multiple rayless species there, how do we separate them from one another? The Eucephalus in this part of the world is uh, separated by various 
diagnostic characters, which include uh, size characters, uh, shape characters, pubescence, the, all troubles. They're all quantitative traits that vary along a continuum. And also presence and absence or absence of rainforest, which sounds like it should be a, a qualitative character, but in fact, it's as quantitative as the others. This is just um, some illustrations of the, of the differences. Some of the species have, are more or less glabrous. Some of them have minute glandular hairs. Some of them have uh, a woolly tomentum. One of the species is called tomentellus. And uh, these, sometimes these hairs occur together, but often you can recognize woolly types and glandular types and more or less uh, uh, glabrous types. We first uh, took a morphological measurements from a whole series of specimens, field collected by my, my co-author Tom Kay and a lot of her various specimens, and we measured a whole lot of morphological features on those. So this is a principal components analysis of about 270 specimens. Um, and we did many iterations of these analyses, the, trying to tweak it so that we could assign species names in a way that would produce the tightest cluster. So we kept looking at outliers and reassigning them to different species names. And this was the best we could do. And you can see on this, um, on this uh, principal components analysis, we can certainly distinguish morphological trends. The specimens towards the top and left of this plot are, um, tend to be glabrous or glandular and are rayless, and the specimens at the bottom right are rayed and uh, tend to be woolly pubescent, but various combinations occur. So the blue dots, which are the rayed species, Lodophilus, look more or less distinct, but they all overlap, and even that species overlaps with the others on the right-hand side of the graph. So we found that the, um, the, with the best we could do is assigning them um, specimens on the basis of morphological criteria to the tightest clusters still produce overlap. There's, there's a, a, a broad intergradation. There's no way around that. We looked specifically at ray florette numbers to see what the variation was amongst plants. And, and I started doing this because two of the species um, in descriptions uh, usually key as rayless, but every now and then they had two or three or four rays on a head. And I thought, is this a good character? or not. So we counted rays on a whole lot of specimens and we examined that and we found a complete continuum of ray number across all the heads that we looked at. The species extensive, um, overlap extensively. So nominally, Lodophilus is rayed and the others are not, but that doesn't really work out. Sometimes Lodophilus has rayless heads, sometimes the others have rayed heads, and we found every intermediate. We found not only differences amongst specimens, but differences within specimens. So we looked at max and min numbers of rays on the flower heads of all the specimens we had that had multiple heads, and we found variation that was often exceeded the variation amongst, among taxa. Uh, this, this plot shows the maximum versus the minimum number of rays on a head for the same plant. So we, what we found is that some plants had up to 12 rays on, on the biggest head and then other, several other heads with no rays at all. So you get different species depending on which branch of the inflorescence you were using to key it. We looked specifically at um, Eucephalus vialis and its close, uh, closely similar specimens since that's the species we were supposed to be focusing on to see whether it occurred in the, in the um, southern part of, it, of the range of this whole group. And what we found was that uh, if we took eucephalus-like plants from the whole range from Northern California to up to West Central Oregon, we could see that there was a, um, there was a recognizable endpoint that we could label um, vialis. It's, uh, large leaved quite tall plant, which is largely glabrous. And we could separate that from um, at the other end of the continuum, which was glandular and, and smaller leaved plant. We can't rule out, we don't have um, common garden size, so we can't rule out that some of this variation is actually um, phenotypic plasticity. So that would be an interesting thing to pursue. But what we could see is that uh, is the Eucephalus vialis like plants didn't really clump out anywhere. They were, they were at the end of a continuum. We then did a molecular uh, analysis. We looked at 
at uh, chloroplast DNA variation in, in a couple of different regions, and this is part of a larger study of uh, other species um, in the group and some related genera as well. And what we found is practically zero variation. The chloroplast sequences were all extremely similar. So we didn't pursue that. We, we went on to look at ITS variation, and we found um, quite a bit of variation. And it, you can see on this um, on this network um, a couple of clusters on left and right. <coughs> um, but what we can uh, say is that the differences, the molecular differences that we found, showed relatively little resemblance to to the morphological differences. If you look at this uh, this network of, of uh, DNA variants for ITS, you can see that um, individual species, as based on morphology, are often found, often had different haplotypes, and that individual individual um, genetic variants often were represented by several species, so it, the correlation wasn't good. What we can say is that is that Eucephalus vialis, as well as the homogeneous um, molecularly, uh, the, the uh, Specimens that we assigned to that species on morphology all clustered out in one group, but other things have those variants as well. Uh, Eucephalus burri, which is from the Sierra Nevada, is also relatively distinct, not because it's so easy to separate out morphologically, but because it's probably geographically separated and different variants are found there. And Anglomania, I was in that group too, although we can't say much about that because our sample was so small. But all the other species, Every species had lots of different variants and, and there was no obvious relationship at all between morphology and, and molecular variation. We also looked to see if the, if the molecular variants showed any kind of geographic pattern and really uh, they didn't. They were all over the place. What we can say is that uh, some variants only, um, some, some, um, some geographic regions only had one uh, variant, so the northernmost part of the range we were looking at in central Oregon, um, they pretty much all had one molecular type, which turned out to be correlated with the Eucephalus vialis populations there. Uh, that, the the uh, same was true of Eucephalus burri in the Sierra Nevada. So the northern and southernmost areas of our study range had somewhat distinct genetic um, molecular variants and all the others were everywhere. So um, there's no correlation between molecular variation and geographic variation either. So this group is, it, it's a continuum and all our efforts to separate out pieces of the continuum um, are met with mixed success. This is a schematic to summarize. Uh, it's, it's a very approximate representation of, of what, what we could recognize as um, species that we can give labels to and uh, also their geographic representation. So the top of the graph is north, the bottom of the graph is south, and, and the compass directions are right. And the uh, most recognizable variants on this diagram are Eucephalus vialis in, in central western Oregon, which is a tall rayless species that's usually glabrous, the Eucephalus latophilus, which is usually ray, uh, and is typical of the Oregon Cascades, comes down into Northern California, and then Eucephalus burri in the Sierra Nevada. And then the other two species, which uh, have received a lot of attention and people keep finding specimens and wondering what they are and what they call them, they basically are all the intermediates in, in between. So. And, and I will say that, uh, along with some other people that, that have um, already talked, that I, I have a kind of cavalier attitude towards species as a result of working on assays. <laughs> and, uh, and so I would basically try to ignore Eucephalus glabratus and Tomatellus whenever I could. Um, I'm, I haven't assigned them to varieties of, of any of the other species because that forces me to make a division between the, the other species, which I don't think is really there. But they are species of little importance in my um, in my opinion, because they simply represent the, the intermediate zones between other species that are better marked. So, just to summarize, you know, what, what, can, what generalizations can come out of this? And of course we know that there are always going to be a problem species, and asters are, are, are well known to, to be in that group. And for plants, we recognize that speciation can often be a very long, drawn-out process, and that... Um, 
even after we have things that are, are morphologically recognizably distinct that we think can be called separate species, they they have genetic exchange, and so the, the plants don't care. You know, they're not worried about our inability to put them into nice, neat categories, and so they continue to integrate often well after we think we have separate species. Um, and so, if we have that kind of situation, what should we try to do? What should how should we spend our, our conservation resources? Um, the, there has been, of course, uh, um, decades of argument about what a species should be in plants. These, this is a, a broad definition which various zoologists and, and uh, botanists, well-known people, have, have adhered to. They think a species should be uh, phenotypically and genetically distinct. They, should, they think ideally it should be allopatric from other close relatives. Uh, and intergradation is allowed, but just at the species boundaries. And that's very difficult when the intergradation seems to cover a broad geographic area. So what we can try to conserve is whatever are the most morphologically uh, distinguishable races. We, after all, need criteria for recognizing them on the ground. We can try to recognize locally adapted forms that are geographically or ecologically distinct. And we can try to conserve genetic diversity. And in Eucephalus, um, our recommendation is that uh, Vialis be recognized as a distinct species and, uh, and conserved where it is where it is most recognizable, which is really only the northern um, part of the study range here in in the west central Oregon. And so we concluded that there's there's nothing truly uh, Eucephalus vialis like in southern Oregon or, or northern California. And my co-author Julie was very relieved about that. It saved her some headaches, but. Uh, the other species that are distinct are, are Letophilus in the Cascades and Brewer in the south, and those are both common and, and not at risk. So uh, conservation dollars are best spent on tax so that we can actually recognize when we see them, and that does not include the Southern Oregon, Northern California uh, po populations in this species complex. They're taxonomically intermediate, and, and they're not at risk. So I'd just like to thank all the people that helped with this, all the people that, that contributed field time and lab time and uh, morphological measurement time, and also the people that helped us uh, get funding for the project and provided pictures, that particularly includes Jerry Carr from Oregon State, um, and much helpful discussion. Thanks very much.